All right, Titus chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 10. Last week, we studied the idea that the churches, especially in Crete, here that Titus is speaking of, the book of Titus is speaking of, they were composed of immature believers, there were a lot of false teachers who were uh, just failed to be rebuked, and they needed to be rebuked, and so Paul is writing to Titus, telling him, that he needs to rebuke and put things in order and, and set up mature believers in the church. You know, Paul had no problem speaking against falsehood. It was not, uh, not a weakness that Paul had. He was very good at defending the truth of God, and he's encouraging Titus to do the same, to speak strongly and to encourage the church to make sure that only God's truth is being proclaimed at church. And really, it needs to go a step further that that only God's truth is being proclaimed by God's followers, by believers. We're not to proclaim our truth. And Paul's going to, he's going to encourage Titus uh, to do that and to do it strongly. And so we'll look at today, we're going to look at the perverse nature of false communication, specifically false teachers, in what and how they communicate. And I didn't mean to alliterate. I actually finished the sermon and was looking it over and realized I alliterated it. I mean, deeply alliterated it. Uh, So it just happened. So hopefully that helps you uh, remember it a little bit more. So let's look at the the words that Paul uses as he describes the false speaking that is going on in the church. Really the filthy communication of the church. Start reading in verse 10 with me. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in their works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. And so we see right away the deceitful mouths that these false teachers and false believers, I'm going to use the term false teachers a lot, but it's also false proclaimers. They maybe aren't necessarily, they shouldn't be teachers, but they're setting themselves up as instructors of truth or instructors of what is religious. And uh, this is what Paul is speaking against. And so we have this description of the Cretans and their the false teachers, the the propagators of uh, falseness. And so he gives three descriptors. He calls them uh, insubordinate, idle talkers, and deceivers, or unruly, vain talkers and deceivers. And so he calls them insubordinate. They refuse to submit to authority. It's a refusal to submit to the things that are pure, the things that are being taught that are pure. Verbally, they may even submit, but in actuality, they don't. And so you're going you're gonna to hear me say a lot that they're hypocrites. And that's exactly what they are because they're trying to proclaim a righteousness. It's a false righteousness because they won't practice the things that they're proclaiming. And so he calls them unruly. Behind the scenes, they're, they're working against the very things that they proclaim or they're working against the things that, uh, that are the truth that the church is proclaiming. And I'll say that this is an easy thing to do today. And here's why I think it's easy. In fact, I think it's a lot easier for us to do today than it was in Titus's day. And that's because we, we have a form of communication at our very fingertips where we can be insubordinate, unruly, contrary to the things that, uh, that we, we say we are. And I don't just mean social media, but, but texting, emails. All forms of communication can... Uh, except for verbally, well, you can even send verbal messages too. So all, really, all forms of communication can be done now through a device, not face-to-face, and it can, it's even easier. There's less accountability, to be honest. 
And so it's easy to be unruly or insubordinate. Well, he also describes them as vain talkers. It, it, it means empty talkers or blatherers. These, these, literally, it means to say things with force and passion, but lacking substance. So they're passionate about what they're proclaiming, and we're going to see they're Judaizers. So they're proclaiming this quasi-religion that you, uh, you believe in Christ, but you also need to be circumcised. And there's certain things like Jewish traditions, certain Jewish traditions that you need to follow. And if you're really saved, then you're going to do those things, and it's going to be evident to everyone around you. And so they're teaching a religious code or a religious conduct as well as relationship with Christ, which is contrary to Scripture. And so they're just empty talkers. They're passionate about it. They're forceful, but they really have nothing of substance or value to say. It's vain. It's empty. However, they keep speaking because they want to say things that matter. And this world is filled with people who say things because they want to matter. They want themselves to matter. And it's really a form of selfishness and self-deceit that they think that their, their truth matters more than others or matters more than the Word of God. And so they say things that they may themselves believe, but they're, it's untrue. It's empty. It's fruitless. It has no value to it. On top of that, he calls them deceivers purposely misleading other people literally it means mind deceivers and it, it means they can deceive themselves in their mind but they also look to deceive others and lead others astray in fact they're leading people away from god not towards god and we'll see that in some of the things that they teach they're leading people towards a, a pursuit of self-worth and self-value rather than value that's found in who god is and the value he's placed upon us and so they're deceitful. They've even convinced themselves that their methods are good and correct, while the, the patterns and, and methods of others is wrong. And it's really a sign of immaturity, and that's what Titus will keep coming back to, is that the church is filled with un, immature believers, people who, who say one thing and do another. We just call them, we call that hypocrisy. But it's more than that. It's a form of self-love. They love themselves more than they love the believers around them, and at times, often, more than they love God. And so they're deceitful. They exaggerate stories, embellish facts, alter the truth. Why? Because they feel good when people listen to them, when people follow them, even if it involves poor methods. Now listen, I could... I could have stopped right there. I've got two pages just on this section. It could be a whole sermon in and of itself. Just that the, what, what, they're, what he's saying here about these people. But don't worry, I'm going to move on. But it, it really poses an important question for us. Does your speech possess any of these qualities? Because these are not qualities of a believer. These are not qualities of somebody who is mature in the faith, who's walking with the Lord. Insubordinate speech, idle talk, deceitful language, none of that is becoming of a follower of Christ. And so we need to ask ourselves, does my speech or my communication resemble that at times? Now listen, the Bible is really clear on speech. In fact, probably the strongest passage in all of the Scripture on communication, I would say, would be James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 1 reads, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So he has this, James gives us this command to be careful. And by the way, when we think teacher, we think a formal situation like standing behind a pulpit or behind a lectern in a classroom, instructing people. And yet we're, if you're a parent, you're a teacher. You're an instructor. If you're a boss, then at times you're an, a teacher, an instructor. And so what are we teaching those under and around us? James tells us we have to be careful. Now he is speaking of, of formal teaching here especially. But notice the words, the language that James uses. James 3 verse 5 says this, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. 
See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. And so we have the tongue, one of the smallest muscles in the body, yet one of the most powerful, destructive. He calls, he says here, James says it's full of iniquity. And yet who can tame the tongue? Verse 8, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And so we use methods. We try religion to tame the tongue. And yet deep inside we know that the tongue is simply springing forth from our heart. And no one can tame that except for God. And so we get to James 3 verse 9. And I think this is actually the saddest verse out of all of these. James 3, 9 says, With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? And the answer is obviously no. And we know that it springs from the heart. And yet we have this phrase, I find verse 9 so convicting and powerful at the same time that with our tongue we, we bless God and we curse men. Which means we sit here today and we sing blessings to God and we give God praise and we use our, our lips, our tongue to declare the goodness of God and then with, within the hour or two hours, it's likely we might use our tongue to tear someone down, to criticize, to say painful and hurtful things. How terrible that we use our tongue that way. How unfit it is for Christians to speak that way. You know, if left unchecked, the tongue naturally spews forth the garbage and filth of a depraved heart. And yet, only God can change that. And so here, Paul is challenging Titus in Titus 1 to confront, and we're going to get to this here, that's the solution, but he tells us who the worst offenders are. The end of verse number 10, he says, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And so we have the worst offenders here are these religionists. These religious people who declare that, that if you follow their, their method, their, their model, then you're going to be holy and you're going to be good. Now here he identifies their Jewish religionists. Uh, and, and they're teaching, as I said, that you have to be circumcised and follow some of the Jewish tradition in order to be saved. You want to believe in Jesus, that's fine. You can believe that he's the Messiah. But you also have to do these covenantal things that God told the Jewish nation to do. Otherwise, you're not really part of Christ. And they're teaching that. In fact, they're teaching that in the church and nobody's stopping them. Nobody's, nobody's saying, no, because I got this letter from Paul that he wrote to Ephesus that tells us that we're not saved by works, uh, that, that we can't do anything to add to our salvation. No one's saying, but, but we know from the book of Romans, I don't even know if Romans was written at the time, forgive me, but, but the Romans tells us that the, 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 the best works that we have are just filthy rags to God. Nobody's confronting them. By the way, you can go to the Old Testament and find these things to be true as well. All through the Old Testament, people were saved by faith. Nobody's challenging them. Nobody's saying those things that you're saying, they, boy, they seem really focused on man, not on the Lord. Nobody's challenging those. These religious leaders are teaching people things that sound good, but they're not true. Can I tell you what some of those things sound like today? Like teaching that man makes himself acceptable. Teaching that doing our best is good enough. Teaching that the pursuit of religion is good rather than the pursuit of 
relationship with the Lord. Teaching that actions of keeping the law, not necessarily the heart submission to the law, is what matters. Teaching that faithfulness equals faith. Now be honest. That last one might hit home. Because maybe you grew up in a church that did that. Or you've been associated at times with churches that teach that being faithful means you have faith. And it doesn't. It's really easy to teach faithfulness. Faithfulness is is a bunch of rules, lists, do's and don'ts, things that you can wrap your head around, things that you can see, things that you can feel, things that you can observe, uh, uh, things that you can say, and you do those things, and therefore you're faithful, and therefore you're acceptable to God. That's not what Scripture says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It doesn't say without faithfulness. Just because they sound the same doesn't mean they are the same. And so, Paul tells Titus, I have the solution. Here's the solution. They must be stopped. Stop these false proclaimers. They must be called out in their lie. They must not be allowed to speak. And so Titus is charged with silencing falsehood. They're teaching things contrary to Scripture. In fact, they're even leading whole households away. They're subverting the very work of God. Whole households are being deceived, which means whatever it means, the father, the mother, uh, both the father and the mother and the children, they're all following this false teaching, this false pattern of, of being acceptable to God. And it's not true. And it's infiltrated the church and it's becoming dangerous. It's literally turning people away from the truth. And the church is filled with with people who aren't any different from the society around them. And that's true today. That's true in our society. That there are churches filled with people who are no different from the society around them. Their heart and their life lacks distinction. And he tells us why they're doing it. The end of verse 11, they're doing it for the sake of dishonest gain. They they love money. And they're using people to try and gain wealth themselves, which is another form of self-love. And they must be confronted. It's imperative to stop it. Lies and untruth must be confronted. Otherwise, what happens? He tells us the innocent are led away. The innocent are deceived. The innocent become poor representatives of God because they think a pattern is what makes us holy rather than a relationship with the Lord. In 2002, I spent a summer in Scotland on a missions trip, an extended missions trip. And I I was staying with a family, a great family. But one day I decided to leave that family, give them a little time without me. And they probably needed it. And so I, I just walked into the heart of the city of Edinburgh to what's called the Royal Mile. It leads from the palace uh, up to the castle, Edinburgh Castle, very famous. And I was just walking and observing, watching people and uh, reading historical things and uh, observing this very old city. I mean, uh, thousands of years old. Beautiful place. And I, I came across a placard on the side of a building. Actually, it was on the side of a tavern which I normally wouldn't stop to read, but this one was thought-provoking. It was called Deacon Brody's Tavern. And I'm reading this placard of Deacon Brody's Tavern, and and so I'm reading this story. I want to tell you basically the story. It's the legend of Deacon Brody. He died in 1788. He's one of Edinburgh's most fascinating characters. He's actually the real-life inspiration of Robert Louis Stevenson's book, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Deacon Brody, which, by the way, Robert Louis Stevenson was from Edinburgh, so they, were, they weren't c- quite contemporaries. Uh, Deacon Brody died before. But Deacon Brody lived a, a horrible double life. On the surface he, was a, surface, he was a respected gentleman. He was a city councilor, and he was deacon, not of a church, but he was deacon of the incorporation of rites and masons. 
He was a professional cabinet maker and a professional locksmith. In fact, he was renowned for his abilities in cabinet making, extremely skilled, so he made high end. He had only writ the richest, highest society were his clientele. Beneath the surface, though, he drank and gambled excessively to the point where he received an inheritance of 10,000 pounds when his father passed away. That would, it's equivalent to millions and millions of dollars. He drank and gambled it all away. And soon he turned to an illicit lifestyle. He actually had two mistresses, and he fathered five illegitimate children that were known. And the hidden life was expensive to maintain, and so he turned to burglary. In fact, he used his profession as a cabinet maker and a locksmith to, to take molds of the most luxurious homes and businesses in Edinburgh, and then he pillaged them. It went on for years. He worked alone for the first few years, and no one had any idea it was him. And when I say he, he pillaged, he stole what would be today to equi uh, equivalent of tens of millions of dollars. No one had a clue. Well, soon he got greedy and he wanted more, so he took on a couple of accomplices. Most he ever had was four. Also, surprisingly, a gang of high-end businessmen. So no one suspected them until they had a botched att uh, attempted robbery of the excise office in Chisel's Court. So this is the highest government building they were going to rob. It was botched. They found out he fled to Amsterdam where he was arrested and brought back to Edinburgh. His trial lasted one day, and on October 1st, 1788, at the age of 47, he was hung at the old Tolbooth Jail. The most ironic twist is that he was executed on a more new efficient uh, hangman's gallows that he himself had designed. Nobody suspected him. He seemed reputable, a gentleman, and yet he was a hypocrite. That's what happens when we pursue deceit. Not only, though, in the church in Crete are the people deceitful in their language and what they're saying, they're also, in action, they're also dishonest in their motives. And so we see their, their dishonest motives starting in verse number 12, which I really like verse 12. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. <laughs> and I find it ironic here. They're selfish, all right, so their description is pretty clear. Their actions are all for their own benefit. They're selfish, right? All these descriptors are, are extremely selfish. And so we have this honest prophet, or at least he's honest about this one thing, that they're always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. They, they cannot be described as working for God. In fact, we already were told in verse 11, they, they seek material gain, dishonest wealth. They don't care who they're using or abusing in the process as long as they, in the end, become wealthy. So they're not described as God-pleasers, but, but self-seekers. They can't be described as loving people because they're, it's dishonest towards other people. They mistreat and abuse people. Yet they exist within the church. It's where they're living and operating, inside the church. And so we get the self-description. I say self-description because it's one of them speaking against the others. And you know what he's saying. He's saying, listen, you can't trust those guys. Trust me. Trust me. They're lazy. Oh, man, they're liars. They're horrible. But trust me, I'm not like them. In actuality, he's exactly like them. And so their self-description is liars. They lie and manipulate and misuse anyone they can in order to gain profit. He calls them evil beasts. It means rude or cruel. They want themselves to be in charge. They want to be king. They want to look the best, so they tear others down. They want to be the most profitable, so they misuse people. He also calls them lazy gluttons or slow bellies. They, they feel that they deserve everything. Physically and spiritually, they're lazy. 
And so they're going to take the easiest road. And the easiest road is to let other people profit and steal from them or take from them. And so they live double lives. They're hypocrites who cannot and won't live out the principles that they proclaim in the church or that are proclaimed in the church. And so Paul gets to, to the point, and it's meant to be pointed, literally. He says this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. Rebuke them sharply. They're to be rebuked because sin should not be permitted in the church. And listen, it is hard to rebuke selfishness, is it not? If you have a fellow believer, a Christian, a friend, somebody close to you who behaves selfishly, it's hard to rebuke that. You know why? Because they also know us. And they know the selfishness that we also possess. And this is kind of part, partially will be Timothy's point. Is that we have to, we, we are to live in a way that is exemplary. Because here, everyone can look at these people. In fact, they can even look at themselves, right? This prophet can look at the other false proclaimers and say, man, they're, they're liars and they're lazy gluttons and they're evil beasts. Oh, they're, look, it's so easy to identify these, these big sin patterns in their life. Meanwhile, they can't identify it in their own life. Right? He identifies lies, he identifies rudeness, he, divide, he, he identifies laziness in, in others, but this, this prophet can't see it in himself. It's hard sometimes when we're so close to our own sin that we can't recognize it, but we can sure see it in other people. How easy it is for us to recognize sin in others that is ironically evident in our own life and paul is speaking of yes he's speaking of false believers here he's speaking of false teachers here but frankly if we're going to be honest this is extremely applicable to us as well so let me ask you do you easily see a certain sin in other people that probably irritates you but is actually quite prevalent in your own life I think one of the easiest is pride. We see pride in other people, and we see it. And man, we, we despise that other people are arrogant and prideful. Meanwhile, we harbor just as much pride in our own life. Or selfishness. Or poor communication. Well, this person, they say these things, and, 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 and they're, it's not like they're not even thinking. They've turned their brain off totally. I can't believe they're, they're that dumb. You know, and meanwhile, we do the exact same thing. Or wasteful. Or lazy. Or anger. Just put plainly, do you excuse too easily your own sin? And so what's the, what's the response that Paul tells Titus to have? It's actually really clear. He says, therefore, rebuke them sharply. Literally, it means to sever with an axe or large knife. Now listen, last week I spent a little bit of time talking about how we're to be careful in our use of God's word because it's meant to be a scalpel that removes the, the cancer and the infectious sin of our own life. And it's tender at times, that's good. But there's also times where, where sin is so destructive it must be chopped off and severed in the church. On an individual basis, yes, tender and careful. But in the church, it can be so destructive, it must be severed. And that's what he says here. To correct it. Literally cut it out. So clearly identify and sever the sin. And yet I want you to see the next part of the verse. It has to go together. This context is so important. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So it's a restorative rebuke. Rebuke with the purpose of sound faith. So it's not just stand up here and sever and say, this, is, this teaching is false and it is wrong and it's not permitted in the church and don't stop there. Continue on and say, here's why. This is the truth. Here's what sound doctrine is. And so 
Paul is really good about this. He rebukes all through most of his epistles. He rebukes false teachers. He, he rebukes uh, things that are not true, false doctrine. But he always then gives us the true doctrine. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that we, don't need, to, we need to spend less time on the false doctrine and just more time on the truth. If you know what the truth is, then you'll easily recognize untruth, falsehoods. And that's what he wants the church to understand. So he says, rebuke them with the purpose of sound faith. It's a restorative sense. So there's false teachers. Those are people who are propagating the lies. They need a harsh rebuke. There's false speakers. Those are the people who are just carrying the lie from one person to another. They need to be rebuked and restored. And then there's also just false believers who are just listening and, and soaking it up and believing it because they have no maturity to say, wait, something's not right about what they're saying. They're all lacking maturity and Titus is to correct them and lead them to the truth. And so to correct them, he says, not giving heed or not devoting oneself to error. He must correct the error, but I think the focus is meant to be on the truth. By the way, it is, you've probably heard this before, but the Secret Service, they have two main jobs, protecting the president. The other main job, it's actually bigger, and that is the, the securing of our our monetary system in America. So they handle all false bills, counterfeit bills. And when they're training, uh, when they're training new officers, they don't show them false bills. They don't show them all kinds of different counterfeit bills. They show them the real thing. And they study for hours and days and weeks on end the real monetary system that we use, the real dollars, the real bills. So that the moment they touch a false bill, they know it's false. The moment they see one, they, something isn't right, and they can identify what's incorrect. And the same thing would be true of us. In Scripture, we are told to know the truth. Not just to, to be able to, to recognize or, or discern what is untrue, but to know the truth. That's the standard. And we should know that standard so well that the moment somebody says something false, we can say, Ooh, that, that's actually contrary to to what God has told us. And so I ask you, do you know the truth like that? I'm not saying we never study a false doctrine. But let's put our primary focus on the, the true doctrines, the core doctrines. That's what mature believers do. And so don't give heed. Don't waste your time with false doctrines. Don't waste your time exploring even, in, in a sense, how to defend false doctrines. Know the truth. And then you'll be able to defend. And he gives us some examples. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Uh, Jewish fables or fables would be, uh, Timothy's really also warned of the same thing. He's warned in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 4 uh, about, about myths and endless genealogies. And endless genealogies would have been important in Jewish culture. You could have said, well, I'm related to David, and here's how I know I'm related to David. I go back, and so I'm in this line, or I'm in that line. And people really focused on their, on their, uh, their upbringing or myths, the belief in secret knowledge, numerology, codes, traditions of men. In fact, there's a whole segment of people who believe in numerology that, that if you a assign value to different letters in the Hebrew alphabet, then it adds up to reveal these secret truths. God is not trying to work. God is mysterious, yes, but he's not trying to, to, to cloud judgment or hide truth. He wants us to know the truth. There's not secrets there's not secret levels of Christianity where you learn different things. He gives it to us plain and simple in Scripture, and we're meant to accept it by faith. And yet we have these, these people teaching myths and, and teaching uh, commandments of men. This would be traditions. And they're turning people from the truth. It gives people a sense of false righteousness. They focus people's attention on actions and knowledge rather than on relationship with the Lord, rather than a genuine dependence on God. 
So like I said earlier, it's like focusing on being faithful rather than faith in the Lord. These things lead people away from the Lord and, and it actually gives people a subtle suppression of, of the true spiritual fervor that's been going on in their heart. It appeases people. It lulls them into, into comfort to think that they're okay. They're good enough. Right? God's grace is more than sufficient. It's okay. You don't have to try that hard. Right? Just do these things and God knows. And so we've seen the outward action of these people, their, their false speaking. We've also seen their motives. Now let's take a quick look at the inner man. It's described as defiled. Their minds are defiled. Their minds are impure. These false teachers, that, to, to put it plainly, they haven't been changed by God. They, they appear righteous. They appear to be right, but they're not right with God. Verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. And so they have impure perspective. And listen, it's easy to deceive people. It's easy to deceive people. Millions of people are doing it. You've done it. I've done it. We've all deceived people at times in our life, but we can never deceive the Lord. And the reason they deceive is because they have impure motives. We already saw that they, they're doing it for dishonest gain, but they also lie because they think that they're worthy, that, that they're valuable in and of themselves. Apart from God, they're valuable. They have something to offer that God needs, that the church needs. The church needs these people. That's what they would think. They believe the lie that their truth matters. They, they have, uh, in our modern language, we would say they have a very positive self-image. Positive self-esteem. And they believe the lie that they matter most. And so what's he tell us? Their minds are depraved. Their perspective of life, their perspective of the church, it is corrupted, it is infected with lies. Their conscience is defiled. And it doesn't mean defiled as in their conscience is thinking wicked things and they're just full of sin. I mean, they are, but it means they, their conscience is off. They think they're right and their conscience is not working right. They should be convicted about the things that they're saying, and they're not convicted at all. They've suppressed the word of God in their own life. They've, they've lied to themselves so much that they're beginning to believe the lie. Their conscience has become desensitized to spiritual things. Luke 6, 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and so their heart is corrupt they profess to know god but they deny him and here's how we see it they deny him in their works ultimately they're denying him in their works and this is where false teachers can often lead people astray for quite a while because false teachers want to hide their lives now i think it was, it's easier to hide our lives today than it was back in in paul and titus's day because you lived in the community. You had to operate in the community. You needed the community in order to live. Now, we don't need that. I mean, honest, it's getting even, it's getting, we're, we're becoming even less communal. I can, I could very easily live in, in the, the center of Westfield, in, in the center of the metropolis, the population, and never speak to anyone. I, I can exist in my home, never leaving my home, Right? I can have my food delivered, I can have my entertainment delivered, and I can do all of it over the computer. We're living in very independent lives, which means if I can do that all over a computer, all over my phone, then it means I can hide all my actions from people. There's no accountability. And it's getting harder and harder to live honestly in this world, or for people to live honestly, because we can live secretly. And so these types of people have to hide their works because their works actually deny 
their words. They go against. And so eventually this person has fooled everyone around them and burned every bridge that they can. Eventually people find out that the things that they say and the things that they do are vastly different. In fact, their works, look at their works, they're described as abominable, disobedient, and disqualifying. And today, false teachers can hide themselves and keep people at a distance so they never see their actions. This is, listen, this is the exact reason we don't want accountability in our life. Because if I let people get too close to me, they're going to start asking hard questions. They're going to start asking what I read in my Bible. How I've been walking with the Lord. And frankly, that scares us that people will know the intricate details of my faith or my lack of faith and so we keep people at a distance we talk in platitudes we talk about the weather we talk about work we talk about spiritually neutral things because we don't want people getting too close they might recognize the immaturity that we really have may that not be what's going on in our heart in our church. That's what's going on with these false believers, these false speakers, these false proclaimers. And if they refuse to repent, then their works, their very works, will proclaim against them. So verse 16, they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, and they're abominable. That means that they are idolatrous and unholy. So what's the idol that they're following? What's the idol that they're worshiping, that they're pursuing? It's themselves. It's self-love. They're described as being disobedient. It, it literally means unpersuadable. Nobody can convince them that they're that bad. Nobody convince them, can convince them that their method is incorrect, that their mindset is wrong. Nobody can convince them that the, the sin is really that bad in their life. They downplay it all. They ignore people. They will not listen. They're not teachable. They don't want to be accountable. And lastly, they're disqualified. It literally means worthless, to be cast away. In fact, they're disqualified for every good work. They shouldn't be serving in the church because their life is contrary to the message of the gospel. Remember what Paul first charged Titus with? He charged him with putting things in order. To, to find these people in the church who need to be discipled and bring them to spiritual restoration. And that's the job of every spiritually mature believer. To be accountable. To disciple one another to challenge one another. Spiritually mature believers speak the truth and they do it in love, which means they know the truth and it means they desire the truth in other people. It means we place the spiritual needs of other people ahead of our own comfort and ahead of our own desires. And what's the opposite? Spiritually immature people, spiritually ignorant people seek to please themselves and they live for their own self-interest. And so they're disqualified. They're, un, they're unpersuadable. They're always right. And no one can teach them otherwise. And they're idolatrous. They're worshiping themselves. And so let me ask you, how are you helping other people walk with Christ? How are you helping develop people spiritually? And maybe it goes all the way back to the beginning of making yourself accountable to other people. Listen, this is why our Wednesday night Bible studies, so important. Uncomfortable? Yes. Sometimes, really uncomfortable. But so important for our spiritual development to draw close with other people who have our spiritual well-being in mind as well. Not just their own. So what are you doing spiritually to invest in other people, to help people set things in order in their life? How are you being a disciple maker who meekly 
That means tenderness and strength help others walk with Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, it is so hard at times to build relationships with people who challenge us spiritually and correctly. I pray you'd help us to surrender our own desires, to surrender our own pride. It's really pride that holds us back because we think we are better. We don't want anyone telling us that we're not. But Lord, as we open up your word, we realize that we are depraved, defiled, in desperate need of redemption, of restoration, of forgiveness. So Lord, I pray you'd help us. Let's be honest with ourselves today. Where are you at spiritually? Could you honestly before God say that you are mature spiritually, that you're walking with the Lord, that you desire the things that that God desires? I'm not saying you're perfect, but by faith, you're trying to please the Lord and stay close to the Lord. Or is it just about faithfulness, doing the right things, saying the right things, behaving in the right way. How are you helping other people? The motto of our church is to make and mature disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. How are you doing that? How are you investing and being invested in by other spiritually mature believers? Because otherwise... We're independent, living our own lives, and likely being led away with lies, our own lies that we foster in our hearts. Lord, help us. We need it. We need to properly evaluate our lives right now. And then, Lord, we need friends, and I think deep down we, we all, we long for it. We long for people who will care about our soul. We care about our lives, but we're afraid because we're afraid of getting hurt. We're afraid of people being uncaring and unkind. And yet you tell us as mature believers, that's what we're to be. We're to be loving and kind. We're to speak the truth and love. So Lord, I pray you would help us to be the right kind of friend, to be a a, a spiritually mature believer who doesn't put people down, who who isn't lazy spiritually, who's not deceitful in in our language and action. But Lord, we're trying to build people up And even though that's uncomfortable to us at times, Lord, we do it because we love you and we want to love you by loving other people as well. Lord, help us. We all need, obviously, to take steps in maturity. I pray, Lord, you convict us very specifically about what we need to be doing. Maybe it's just attending Wednesday night. Maybe it's finding one person who we can confide in Maybe it's going and confronting someone who we know needs a challenge. But Lord, I pray you'd help us to do it all, speaking the truth with love. We thank you for this time together. I pray that even now as we sing, that we lift up our voices in heartfelt contrition to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.